One afternoon, I received an unlikely phone call from a woman. She was a Muslim Somali refugee living in southwest Kansas, and over the past several years, she had become like family to me. I called her a bio, or a sister in Somali. She called me a boy, or brother. She was reaching out to me because she was experiencing extreme pain from the form of female genital mutilation, or FGM, she had experienced as a little girl in East Africa. I had recently traveled to her home country and I would become familiar with this troubling cultural practice and she said, in my culture, I would never normally speak of this with a man, but you are my brother. I'm in need of medical attention and I trust you. Who can help relieve my pain? I felt mixed emotions. I felt anger. Who or what would allow this to happen to a defenseless little girl? I felt sadness. As the father of two young daughters, I wanted to weep at the thought of what she must have experienced. And strangely, I felt joy. Joy because she felt comfortable enough to share this information with me in hopes that help would follow. And as it turned out, as the CEO of Kearney County Hospital, I knew some mission-driven family physicians who had developed a national reputation for their work in women's health and maternal child health. This picture of two of them is featured prominently at the KU School of Medicine in Wichita. Our doctors practice full spectrum family medicine, which includes inpatient and outpatient care, ER and trauma care, endoscopy, surgical obstetrics, nursing home care, psychiatric care, and even occasional house calls for patients young and old. And their outcomes back up their clinical, clinical scope of practice, rivaling those of even some specialists in urban areas. But we are no urban area. So the Washington Post last year was nice enough to name us the 10th most remote town in the United States under 5,000 people, excluding, excluding, of course, Alaska and Hawaii. Um, it's not a contest we knew we were in. It's certainly not one we wanted to win, but as we examine the list more closely, we realize that over the previous uh, year, we had delivered babies from eight of the 30 most remote towns in the United States, so we are up there with Montana. Except this is Montana. <laughs> you all know where I'm going with this. This is Kansas. To be fair, this is half of Montana. This is all of Kansas. <laughs> but this is also Kansas. Patients or people from 30 countries live in our service area and they move, and they, they're including refugees from some of the most challenged parts of the world, and they move to southwest Kansas to work in the nation's largest beef packing plant, which is owned and operated by Tyson Foods, a company that loves and supports its team members. From our town of 2,200 people, our team at KCH serves nearly 20,000 patients from across southwest Kansas, and many of them are team members at that Tyson plant, and we've grown quickly. In 2005, our small hospital delivered less than 100 babies a year, and now we deliver nearly a baby every day. Perhaps this is in part because our physicians, who each receive 10 weeks of paid time off each year, choose to use some of that time to serve in the developing world, many times in some of the same places where our newest neighbors originate. And we've led a recruitment effort that is built on what is now a robust network of over two dozen mission-driven uh, family medical providers. Almost all of them are millennials, collectively, They've served in all of these countries. The impact of this approach could be summarized with one word, empathy. By serving there, we are better prepared to serve here and vice versa. And it's worth noting that we have no problem finding doctors to practice in our frontier area. One of the most critical service areas that we provide is in maternal health. In a time when rural maternity wards were closing and maternal deaths in the United States were on the rise, we knew if we were to continue providing this service, we needed to do so with measurable excellence, and that began by asking the right questions. So we engaged two very smart public health researchers from KU to learn how local people define their health, 
what services in the major sectors of society they perceived were available that would help them live healthier lives. And similarly, we wanted to know which services in those same sectors would be underrepresented or most important to them. So with the help of some summer interns from Baylor University, we achieved an 85% household response rate in the two communities inside our county with less than a 5% duplicate rate. We did this by engaging the common everyday people that Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Tipping Point, calls connectors. They convinced their friends to complete the survey for a $10 Subway gift card. Here's a little glimpse into that data. Hint, it's not all pretty. The two ethnicities most prevalent in our immediate service area are white and Hispanic. We separated the answers by those ethnicities and in nearly every category in the healthcare sector, white people were more aware of services than were Hispanic people. And in all but three categories, Hispanic people desired more services than white people. Lesson learned. If a service is not available in a language you understand, a location you can get to, a time when you can access it, or at a price you can afford, it might as well not exist. Or worse, this drinking fountain ain't for you. You can't sit here. This form of passive discrimination is particularly personal to me because I experienced extreme poverty during part of my childhood years. And at our lowest point, we received our medications from a nun at a homeless shelter. I share this story with you to illustrate what it can feel like being on the outside of healthcare. So at KCH, we had an equity problem. So we asked ourselves, where should we start? What outcome should be our first focus? And we chose gestational diabetic mothers delivering oversized babies for three reasons. First, it was twice as prevalent in our hospital as uh, when compared to the national average. Second, women of color are nearly four times as likely to die during childbirth in the United States uh, when compared to white women. And third, a mom delivering an oversized hypoglycemic baby can be both catastrophic for mom and baby and also extremely expensive. So prevalence, inequity, and cost all informed our decision to make this our immediate strategic focus area. We considered the stakeholders. Who else would like this outcome improved? We came up with this list. Then we analyzed what each stakeholder could contribute to an innovative and collaborative solution. We can all contribute something. We analyzed barriers. Each needed to be acknowledged and addressed in order for us to realize our goal. And we chose to measure that goal through a simple ratio, which could be utilized in any organization that delivers babies. And because the, mother, the lives of mothers and their babies were at stake, we gave ourselves a hard deadline. We committed to developing systems that would improve that ratio in a period of three years. Then we got to work. What followed was the development of Pioneer Baby, a collaborative partnership involving KU Med, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, Ascension Kansas, Kearney County Hospital, and the many Southwest, Clinic, Southwest Kansas clinics providing prenatal care. In addition to providing a full-time maternal child health nurse as the primary point of contact for, for prenatal patients, a maternal fetal medicine specialist began to fly out from Wichita to Lakin once per month to see patients, but also to empower our full spectrum family doctors and our entire maternal child health care team to better manage the prenatal care process. His private flights were and still are funded by the Children's Miracle Network. Here's how we proved the impact of Pioneer Baby. Over the past four years, the percentage of oversized babies being born to gestational diabetic mothers at Kearney County Hospital has, have, has decreased from 84% down to as low as 18%. That is real, measurable impact. Then, Lee Cowan from CBS Sunday Morning came out and asked, how'd you do that? We told him. He told six million other people. Then, Seema Verma, CMS administrator, uh, featured KCH's maternal, maternal child health model in her public announcement of CBS, or CMS's 2019 rural health strategy. 
And among those paying attention was Minnesota's very own U.S. Senator Tina Smith, who happens to care deeply about rural communities and maternal child health. Her team called again, asking, how'd you do that? We told them as well. They also said to ensure that expectant mothers get the health care services they need both during and after pregnancy, we are co-sponsoring the Healthy Maternal Obstetric Medicine, or Healthy Mom Act. Would you mind looking over this bill for us? Of course, of course we'd love to look at it, and we did. So here is our four-part strategy for developing a new paradigm. First, we ask patients what they need to be healthier. Essentially, what's the right thing to do? Second, we hack the system, bootleg the funding to get the right thing done. Third, we do the right thing, measure the impacts, and then we tell our story. And finally, we leverage that story and the data to advocate for sustainable funding models. Seems simple, right? But it's critical that we know how those services defect, affect diverse groups of people. So we take what we're already measuring and we divide it by people group, race, gender, socioeconomic status, insurance type, zip code are some examples of people groups. Then we ask, just as our nation should be asking, are we okay with the fact that a rural American is more than 50% likely to die due to unintended injury than an urban American? Are we okay with the fact that a black woman dies four times, or, uh, four times more often during childbirth than a white woman? Well, the answer is always no. Because if we excuse any disparity, we run the risk of legitimizing all disparities. And so we de to develop our strategy, we ask and answer these six simple questions. What outcome needs improvement? Who are the stakeholders? Where are there opportunities to share? Why isn't it already happening? How do we measure its success? When do we expect to see progress repeat? We're often asked why we're so successful as a rural or frontier hospital. Why are women willing to drive two hours one way to deliver a baby in our hospital, passing larger hospitals with specialists along the way? Is it because we provide, safely provide vaginal births after cesarean sections when we're one of the only ones in a region to do that? Is it because our C-section rates are lower than the national average, including those in urban areas? Perhaps. But instead of seeking to maximize market share, we are asking, what problem are we trying to solve alongside our other rural partners? What is the right thing to do for the people we all serve? But the answer may also be illustrated through another story. Several years ago, Ifra Ahmed and I became friends. She and I are an unlikely pair. I'm a white Christian man from the progressive west coast of California. She is a black Muslim woman from a very conservative East Africa. But over time, we chose to trust each other. We even traveled together with some friends to an extended family's uh, vacation home uh, in Lake Tahoe. But my wife and I would now trust her with the care of our own children. But something dramatic drew Ephra and I closer together. On March 6, 2017, a spontaneous wildfire scorched the plains of Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma, and one of the towns most impacted was Ashland, Kansas, my former home. The infamous Starbuck fire had consumed nearly 80% of the grassland in that county and nearly engulfed the entire community in flames. Thousands of cattle died, and winds fueled that fire at up to 65 miles per hour. Among the ranchers affected was a friend named Randall Spare. He's an honest, hardworking man who loves his God, he loves his family, and he loves his community. And he, along with many rural Kansans, represent much of the good in America. The Starbuck fire torched his fences, and he was no longer able to safely keep cattle on his land, temporarily compromising his livelihood. So Ephra and a group of her Somalian friends from the Tyson plant made the two-hour one-way drive to Ashland, Kansas, and sacrificed their only day off in two weeks to help him mend his fences. The work was long and hard, but at the end of the day, Randall Spare hugged Ephra Ahmed. Picture a middle-aged, white, Christian, rural American man who spends most of his days working cattle in a ball cap and boots and jeans, pausing to gratefully embrace a young, 
Muslim Somali refugee woman who knew firsthand the realities of growing up as a little girl in East Africa. Do you have that image in your mind? Freeze it, because that is the picture of America. So what does this have to do with maternal child health in rural areas? Following that experience in Ashland, Ifra would later attend the births of the first dozen or so Somali babies at Kearney County Hospital. Two are now named Ifra after her. She served as a translator and a cultural advocate, and among the moms she served was my Somalian sister who conceived and delivered her first baby <coughs> after her successful FGM repair. This new paradigm is both simple and complex. It is the practical application of love and justice. In your organizations, consider what is the right thing to do? How do love and justice align with your organization's values? How do, how does, how do they inform your ethical decision making and the development of strategy? Your answers to these questions will determine your new paradigm. The United States of America is perhaps the greatest country in the history of the world, not because we say it is so, but because we're more than a country. We're a concept that you and me, a black woman from Somali, Kenya, and a white guy from Kansas, are created equal under God, and neither of us should die sooner than the other because of our race, our gender, our socioeconomic status, or our zip code. We live in arguably the greatest place on earth because over the centuries we have proven both willing and able to do the hard stuff. We choose health equity in this decade, not because it is easy, but because it is hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, and because that challenge is one we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one which we intend to win. Thank you.